Island Lake on top of the Grand Mesa. And if you, you've not lived here in Western Colorado, you're missing out on something incredible. The Grand Mesa is the largest flat top mountain in the world. And I've been told there are a thousand trout lakes on top of this mountain or throughout this mountain. Isn't it gorgeous? There's also a thousand mosquitoes per square foot up here. We're in the Father's Business series, as you know, and it's about the fact that Jesus said from the age 12, I'm always going to be about my Father's business. I'm going to say what he wants me to say, do what he wants me to do, interact the way he wants me to interact. And it's been fascinating to watch him, study him through the book of Luke. And we're in chapter 8. Now, if you weren't with us last week, he was on the Sea of Galilee, which is a, a huge lake, much bigger than this one. This one, by the way, has, I have great memories here. My dad would bring us up here to uh, fish for trout when I was young. I, we brought our sons up here to fish years ago. So great memories up here. But the lake that Jesus was on, sometimes it's called the Sea right? But it's, it's a lake that's much larger. And as they came across, as we talked about last week, there was an enormous storm. He slept in the boat. They woke him up. They said, we're going to die. We're going to die. And he gets up and he calms the sea. He calms the wind. And he says, where, where is your faith? Is the, is the question we talked about last week. Now we pick the story up as he arrives, as they arrive on the other side of the sea, on the shore, like we're standing on here. But what they see there is something the disciples are not ready to see. I guarantee you. Now, many years ago, uh, Christy and I lived in the Napa Valley, and you may know the Napa Valley. It's famous for its winery and its grapes, but if you live there, you know it's famous for something else as well. In a sense, it's one of the most beautiful places on the earth, but it's also known for its darkness, its spiritual darkness. Antoine LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan, had a home there for a long, long time. And when we lived there, something really interesting took place. We had a couple of friends who were just a little bit younger than us. And they asked us if we wanted to go on a Jeep trip in the evening. We said, well, of course, we were game. So they took us in their Jeep and we wound up in the hills up above the Napa Valley. And we came to this area, and, and our friend's name was Pete, Pete and Rhonda. And Pete turned to us and said, guess where we are? And we said, I don't know. You know, where are we? It's kind of spooky up here. He said, it is spooky because this is where the Church of Satan meets and does sacrifices. He had actually opened the gate. And when he opened the gate, I'm thinking, I said, Pete, that gate is there for a reason. I don't think we're supposed to go back here. He opened the gate. He drove back there, and it was one of those pitch dark nights. I don't know if you've ever read Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness. It's a classic novel. You need to read it if you haven't. But Napa always did remind us of the little town, I think it's Ashton, in Frank Peretti's novel. Because it has a little community college. It's in a valley. And the whole story is about spiritual warfare and spiritual darkness and a pastor that goes to battle, you know, through the power of the Spirit. And it, it, is, uh, it is spooky. That night up in those hills was one of the spookiest nights we have ever spent. All right. And I remember Pete was kind of ornery. So was Rhonda. And I remember when he went to click on the, the engine for the Jeep to get out of there, I remember it didn't turn on. And he looked at us and his eyes got big and he said, Oh no, we're stuck. And I should have known better because that's the kind of thing I love to do to other people. I, I almost panicked. And then he started the engine. We got out of there. Why do I tell you about this spooky place? Because the place where Jesus and his disciples are going to land, once they've come across through the storm, as we talked about last week, and they land on the shore, it gets spooky. You, you had to have gotten heebie-jeebies by what's about to happen. So here we are back at the cemetery, and it's appropriate, by the way, you might be saying, what is it with this guy in cemeteries? You know I love cemeteries. It's appropriate because we started this videoing of the teaching on Easter, and we started in this cemetery, and we've come full circle, and we're back. We're back to the cemetery because it's really appropriate for what we're going to read today. We're in Luke chapter 8. Jesus, as we said, from the lake, has just arrived on the shore. He steps out of the boat, and we pick the story up in Luke chapter 8, 
verse 26. So they arrived in the region of the Gerasenes across the lake from Galilee. All right, so they had the storm, and now it's probably the next morning. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons, we'll find out how many in a moment, came out to meet him. Okay, so this is an aggressive action by a man, and we're going to read more about uh, how crazy this gets. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. Now the parallel passage in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5, tells us it wasn't just that he was homeless, it wasn't just that he was naked, that would be enough. That should be enough for you to need therapy when we're done talking here. But Mark chapter 5 says that he was taking stones and he was gashing himself. So he's bleeding all over the place. He has scars from other times when he's probably gashed himself, right? And we find out in a moment here that he is so strong that they have tried to chain him down to control him and the chains could not hold them. This is what Jesus sees when he steps out of the boat. Verse 28, as soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. Now, I find that amazing, don't you? We live in a culture where not many people want to claim that Jesus is the son of the most high God, that there's one God and he's his only son. But this demon, or these demons, are not afraid at all to just scream it out. This is a truth. Did you know that demons can speak truth? They just did. James 2.19 says that when we believe, and we make a big deal, right? We call ourselves believers. When we believe, James says, it makes us really no different than the demons who also believe. And we just saw that. They believe, and he goes on to say, and they shudder. They shake. They're scared to death when it comes to who Jesus is. So the next time you want to say, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus, just know that that doesn't hold a lot of water. You know, there's got to be more to that than just, yeah, I think he existed. I think he was the Son of God. There's got to be something more. And when you read the story of Jesus, you find out there is something more. It's not just believing. It's entrusting him with our lives, giving him the ownership of our lives. Okay, on to verse 29. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. This spirit had often taken control of the man even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, What is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. So we're in the cemetery because this man has been running through the cemetery. He's been running. He runs out of the tombs to meet Jesus. And he says, my name is Legion. It probably sounded more like, my name is Legion, or something like that. Legion is actually not a name, it's a number. It's, it's a reference to a number of troops in the Roman army, which was usually somewhere around, it could be as many as 6,000. 6,000. But we think that maybe, because of the other accounts, that when Jesus cast these demons out, they go into, uh, this is foreshadowing here, I'm spoiling the story, they go into 2,000 pigs. So maybe we can assume that there are 2,000 demons in this man, in this one man. So wonder chains could not hold him. So wonder everybody was afraid of him. Here we go, verse 31. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. See, they know what their future is. They have no doubt. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. 
don't miss that. Don't miss that. Whenever Satan or his minions, his demons, want to do something, they have to get permission from the Son of God. See, there is this misnomer, this misunderstanding that, you know, there's Satan and there's Jesus and they battle it out and they're pretty much equals. They are not equal at all. And we see that in this passage right here. So the demons have to ask Jesus permission. And we know this from the story of Job, from the story of when Jesus was interacting with Peter and and Jesus himself says that Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. He has to ask permission. Let that sink in because where we're going with this, I'm not going to make any bones about it, is that Jesus Christ is the most powerful entity in the entire universe and nothing rivals him. Let's finish the story and then we'll kind of unpack it. Verse 33. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. Uh, there's some really comical moments in this crazy story. These herdsmen are running going, you won't believe what happened, you won't believe. They're spreading the news as they run. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane. Other translations say, and in his right mind. He went from this maniac to, in an instant, perfectly sane. I can't say that about many people I know, especially myself. Perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away. And leave them alone, for a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left. He crossed back on the other side of the lake. Now back to the man. The man who had been freed from the demons begged Jesus to go with him. He didn't want to be anywhere where Jesus was not. But Jesus sent him home saying, Now go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all the way through the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. He went from a, a maniac to a missionary, is exactly what happened here. That's the, the summary of the story for this man. From maniac to missionary, isn't that our story? That's really our story. Without Christ, I'm a maniac, living life fully for myself, not caring who I run over, not caring what it takes to get what I want. And when Jesus intervenes, we go from that to becoming missionaries. So we have a maniac who was exercising in a cemetery, running around in the cemetery. We have a Messiah who was exercising the maniac or the demons out of the maniac. And we have a mob who shows up to exercise their freedom to be rid of the Messiah. Everybody's exercising in this story. So that's the story. I mean, the whole thing. We covered it. That's all we're going to cover regarding that story. But now let's pull it apart a little bit and look at the pieces. I, I find it really intriguing. And we've got to start with evil because that's what Jesus and his disciples saw when they stepped outside the boat. Now, i I got I to gotta throw this in here. Do you notice there's nothing about the disciples? During the storm on the sea... The disciples played a major role, right? They're freaking out, they're panicking, they're waking Jesus up. You know, all of a sudden, they're nowhere to be found. Remember the story I told you about Pete and Rhonda taking us up in the hills above Napa? I wanted out of there. I really did. Any way we could get out of there, I wanted out of there. I think, I truly think, that's what the disciples are doing. There's no mention of them. They may have taken one step outside the boat, but then I think they wanted out of there not even mentioned in the story. 
because they saw evil. They saw the face of evil, and it had to scare the heebie-jeebies out of them. So let's talk about evil. Uh, three things. We could say a hundred things about evil, but let's let's uh, really try to bring it down to three things about evil. Number one, evil is everywhere. It's everywhere. Now, how do I know it's everywhere? Because Scripture says that it's everywhere. First John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are children of God, John says. We know that. We're children of God. We've established that. And that the whole world, this is the second thing he says we know, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. I don't know how to make it any more plain than that. Everything, every system in this world, the way things operate, he runs the show. Now we know from the story, God intervenes when he chooses, all right? He uses us sometimes to intervene, but this is an evil place, and we need to come to grips with that idea. G.K. Jesterton put it this way, the doctrine of the fall is the one Christian belief that empirically verifiable, okay? Empirically verifiable means you can't argue about the fall. You can't argue about the evidence of the fall. It's everywhere, and you see it, and I see it. In the natural world, uh, Einstein called it the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy, and he said it is the primary or the premier law of all of science. Even Einstein said things unravel. That's what the second law of thermodynamics says. Things unravel. Things are not good. Uh, I mean, they don't get better. Things break. Airplanes crash, right? Bones break. Bodies wear out. Uh, weeds grow. Have you noticed you don't have to feed your weeds? You don't have to water them? We water our, everything else like crazy and they hardly grow. The weeds grow without any water. That's the second law of thermodynamics. That's what Albert Einstein was saying. That is the reality. That's what John was saying. The evil one runs the show here. More and more often, I'm having conversations with people who are really dismayed and really concerned with how evil things are getting. Can I tell you something? They've always been that way. They've always been that way. It's just that maybe right now it's more apparent. Raise your hand if you're at least 40 years old, okay? Raise your hand if you think evil is, is worse than it's ever been. In our culture, it looks like it, doesn't it? You can't deny it. It's everywhere, and we're dismayed by it. We don't need to be dismayed by it. We need to understand it's a fact of life. Evil is everywhere. The evil one runs the show here, all right? Now, God can intervene, and he does intervene, and that's kind of what this story is about. That's the first thing we've got to lay down as a foundation about evil. Okay, the second thing is that evil masquerades as good, or as light. I read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Satan himself masquerades, he puts on a mask, and he pretends to be an angel of light. Again, we are in shock with what we see going on around us. Why? Because it's new evil? No, I'm telling you, this evil has been around as long as the fall. It's just that we have hidden it well in our culture. And now it's coming out of hiding. Does that make sense? We're not getting more evil. Man is not getting more evil. Man has always been evil. It's just that evil is taking the mask off and it shocks us. Kind of like how the disciples had to have been shocked when they pulled up and said, well, that was a fun ride through the storm. Ah! You know? They had to be shocked at how, how they were in the face of evil instantly. And, and that really bothers us. We have done a good job, if we're honest, we have done a good job in our culture of covering evil, right? Of putting it under the carpet, under the bed, you know, so that we're all going to pretend that we're not evil and this is not an evil culture run by an evil one. The problem with that is that God's Word tells us don't do that. Don't start calling good evil and evil good. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In other words, quit pretending Isaiah says, God says through Isaiah, 
quit pretending that evil is good. And we do. We have believed for a long time in this culture that we are a good people. We are not. And evil is taking the mask off right now, and we got to come to grips with it. Not be shocked, not be, oh, you know, what's happening? Just go, yeah, yeah, uh, it, it all makes sense. It, it's not that shocking, really. We were watching a Francis Chan uh, video the other day, and he talked in there about uh, the Satanic Bible, which is interesting. Uh, he was living in San Francisco, lived, he grew up in San Francisco, not far from Napa, where that opening story I told you was about Napa, and that whole area there has a demonic presence. I know that doesn't shock you. So he has some understanding. He's had some contact with that. And he was talking about the fact that the Satanic Bible has a recurring theme in it. You know what the recurring theme is? This may shock you. He didn't say that it's a recurring theme that uh, here's how you sacrifice animals. Here's the uh, perfect way to dry a, draw a pentagram. He says that the recurring theme in the, in the Satanic Bible is this. Are you ready? Do as you please. Do as you please. That sounds like a lot of churches, I know. I mean, really. We in the modern church have begun to live that way, have lived that way for a long time. Do as you please. Whatever you want to do. That comes straight out of the Satanic Bible. That comes straight out of evil. It is an evil thing. See, but we have masked that as good. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. When you get to do whatever you want to do, whatever you feel like doing, why not? Why would I stand in your way is the idea. The church has stepped back and said, who are we to tell anyone that, you know, you can't do as you please because that's most important in this whole thing. Do as you please. That idea is pure evil. It's pure evil because God never told us to do as we please. He always said, do as I please, please. And he doesn't even need to say please. But that's what he says. I told you this many times, but let me refer to it one more time. A guy by the name of Christian Smith came up with what, after studying our culture, he believes is the fastest growing faith movement. All right? The fastest growing. It's not evangelical Christianity. It's not Mormonism. It's not any of those other things you think of. It is moralistic, therapeutic deism. That's how he entitles it. After studying our culture, what does that mean? Moralistic. It means I should really do good. I, I'm supposed to do good. And there's this afterthought, this parenthetical idea, as I see good. as what I determine to be good. That is moral. That's moralistic. I should be a moral person. But I define what is moral. I define what is good. Therapeutic. I should feel good. Really. I shouldn't have to do anything that doesn't feel good. As I determine me feeling good. And that's a primary part of my faith. Is that I should do the things I feel like doing. Moralistic. Therapeutic. That's very therapeutic for me to feel good. As I perceive what feeling good is for me. And, and I will determine that. And whatever it is, it should be fine. Moralistic, therapeutic, deism. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a God. There is a deity. But he, he's only showing up if I need him. He is the proverbial genie in the bottle. And when I need him, like I get sick, or someone in my family gets sick, or there's a car accident, or, or there's mobs in the street, I call upon him. And he shows up at my beck and call. That's deism. He's out there somewhere. He doesn't interfere. He never interferes with my life. But if I need him, I can call on it. Moralistic, therapeutic, deism. The fastest growing faith, and it has infiltrated the church. And we, some people call it progressive Christianity. We have progressed to that. I'm here to tell you, we have regressed to that. And that is evil. Those ideas are not from God at all. There's another evil masquerade that I want to bring to your attention. And we could do this all day long. Let me give you one more. Here it is. There is no absolute truth. Most people in this culture believe that. There is no absolute truth. Everything, you know, is really up to what we decide is true. 
Did you know that Barna Research tells us that only 10% of believing Christians believe that there is absolute truth? 10% meaning they have a biblical worldview because a biblical worldview is that God's word tells us there is truth there is absolute truth and there and there's everything else but only 10% of us in the evangelical world believe that Did you know that half of Protestant pastors and ministers half of them don't believe in a biblical worldview you see what I'm saying that is evil that's just plain evil because it it goes against everything God has said now we're laying this foundation for what evil is. It's everywhere, right? It masquerades as light. Let me give you the third one, and we're comfortable with it. I want you to think of this story and how the townspeople had actually become comfortable with this guy. And when there was some radical change, they became fearful. When somebody, when God intervened, it, it was scary to them. And they, they would rather have a, a naked, bleeding, screaming maniac running through the, the cemetery, you know, you better be careful, you know, when you go out to put flowers at your grave, you never know who's gonna pop into your picture, a family picture. They were more comfortable with that than they were Jesus. Okay, so we covered the presence of evil, and no matter how comfortable we get with it, it, we still live in a world that's run by the evil one. Let's move on to the power of the everlasting, and this is the exorcising part of the story all right the power of the everlasting that phrase or that word everlasting is really important it's a name for God it comes from Genesis chapter 21 Abraham has made a covenant with Abimelech and it says this then Abraham planted a Tamaris tree at Beersheba and there he called on the name of the Lord the everlasting God his actual name there is El Olam El Olam is, means everlasting. That is a key part of who God is. And God in the physical presence of Jesus is still the everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting. He's always been, always has been. Now, this comes out in an inter interaction that Jesus has with the evil Jewish leaders. And it's, it's kind of comical. I'm going to read it from the message. It comes out of John chapter 8, starting in verse 48. Here we go. The Jews then said, well, that clinches it. We were right all along about you when we called you a Samaritan and said you were crazy, that you were demon-possessed. Do you see the irony there? These guys are calling Jesus demon-possessed. Jesus said, I'm not crazy. I simply honor my father. Thus, the father's business. His whole life was about honoring the father. He says it again. I simply honor my father while you dishonor me. I'm not trying to get anything for myself. God intends something gloriously grand here and is making the decisions that will bring it about. I say this with absolute confidence, Jesus says. If you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to look death in the face. What a promise. Practice what I am telling you. Live my words and you'll never have to face death. Now, we know he's talking about the eternal death, right? The eternal separation from God. At this point, the Jews said, Now we know you're crazy. Abraham died, the prophets died, and you show up saying, If you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to face death, not even a taste. Are you greater than Abraham, who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you think you are? Is what they say to Jesus. You're about to hear who Jesus thinks he is. Watch this. Jesus said, If I turned the spotlight on myself, I wouldn't amount to anything. But my father, the same one you say is your father, put me here at this time in this place of splendor. You haven't recognized him in this, but I have. If I, in false modesty, said I didn't know what was going on, I would be as much of a liar as you. There goes Jesus beating around the bush again. It's really common these days that you're not supposed to call anyone a liar. Jesus seemed to do it fairly often. I would be as much of a liar as you are, but I do know and I am doing what he says. Abraham, your, in quotes, your father with jubilant faith looked down the corridors of history and saw my day coming. He saw it 
and he cheered. The Jew said, you're not even 50 years old. And Abraham saw you. Believe me, said Jesus, I am who I am long before Abraham was anything. That did it. <laughs> that pushed them over the edge. They picked up rocks to throw at him, but Jesus slipped away getting out of the temple. Okay, I know that's a long passage, but do you understand what happened there? Jesus gets in this, this just combative conversation with these guys, and he finally says, you know, you call yourself children of Abraham? He says, I was around before Abraham. And he uses a phrase, why did they lose their minds? And they literally lost their minds. They picked up rocks, and they're going to kill him right now. I mean, you're talking about no trial, you know, no testimony. We're just going to kill you right here. Why did they do that? Because when Jesus said, I am that I am, he was directly quoting God when Moses said, God, who shall I tell the people who ask me who sent me? Remember what God said? Tell them, I am that I am sent you. Meaning, it's not that I was, and it's not that I will be. I always am. I'm outside of the time-space continuum. I am who I am. So when Jesus claims that title, they lose their minds. And they want to kill him because he has just claimed to be God. So there's a lot of people these days who say, Oh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, yeah, he, he was a good teacher. He, he might have been a prophet. He's a really good guy, right? No. No, that's to minimize who he said he was. He said he was God. And we just read it. So what is God doing through the Old Testament? Have you ever thought about that? When the crazy things happen, what is God doing? Well, the people in the Old Testament times had turned to many gods. And God was about using the nation of Israel, using his people, the children of Israel, to show the world, and it literally, literally was to show the world, not just them, to show them the world that he is the only one true God. I am that I am. If you go back to the plagues, those are really intriguing, right? Have you ever thought, God, why didn't you just cut to the chase? Why didn't you just immediately go to the firstborn of the Egyptians and take care of that and save some time and energy? Ever think about why he didn't do that? Why he went through the series of plagues, even one by one. If you study it, you'll find out that each plague represented a prominent God that the Egyptians worshipped. And so what he was doing was well thought out. He was showing the Egyptians that their many gods cannot compete with him. He can take that very thing they worship and turn it against them just with a snap of his fingers. How about Jericho? Remember he told the, told the nation of Israel, so then march around Jericho, you know, for six days on the seventh day, march around seven times, blow the trumpets and shout, hey! And the walls come down. I think I might just raise the dead here. And the walls came down. What is all the gimmickry about? No, he's just doing things so that all the surrounding nations will go, that God's different. That could not have been done by mere humans. You see what he's doing? With Gideon. Gideon, we're, I'm going to use you to fight this army of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, you know, men. And I'm going to have to whittle your army down to 300 so that when you win, there'll be no doubt, I am that I am won the battle. Not you, I am that I am. Nehemiah, God calls him back to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem after they had been taken captive in Babylon. And when they finished the walls, now get this, they finished those walls in 52 days. Nothing against our city government, but if all of a sudden they had to build a wall around our city, it would take 52 days to get through the red tape, right? I mean, be honest. They built the walls in 52 days. That is something only God could do. And when they finished doing that, guess what it says in, in the book of Nehemiah? It says all the nations surrounding them were in awe of their God. See, that's what I am that I am is about. I am the one and only God. And Jesus is saying, and I am that God. That's really uh, important. Jesus steps out of the boat and he is ferocious. All right, you got this man 
full of maybe 2,000 demons running at him, screaming, come sliding at his feet. He is a ferocious lion here. We always talk about the Lamb of God, and he is the Lamb of God. Sometimes, though, he's ferocious. I love what John Eldridge, in his book, Beautiful Outlaw, says about Jesus. Jesus is a locomotive, a juggernaut. For all practical purposes here, he is the bull in the china shop. Religious fog sneaks in to obscure Jesus with lines comparing him to a rose trampled on the ground. Maybe that's your favorite song. I don't know. But think about that line. It's like a rose. Like, like some of these flowers. Jesus reminds me of these flowers that got knocked over and got trampled. Poor Jesus. He says that's what religious fog does. It shows Jesus as helpless, lovely Jesus. Vegetarian pacifist, tranquil, oh wait, that was Gandhi, not Jesus. The ferocious Jesus steps out. He has calmed the wind and the waves, and now he takes on the supernatural. He took care of the natural, now the supernatural. He is ferocious. He is in charge. He is all-powerful. He is everlasting to everlasting. He does not have a beginning and an end. In this story, he takes a human being who is tortured and he transforms him. Again, is that not our story? Some of us are tortured in this life with things that happen to us when we're children or fears or worries. And when Jesus intervenes, when we allow him to step ashore, on our hearts, he transforms us. So Jesus is no Gandhi, and Gandhi is no Jesus. Do you understand that? Really important. What are, what are the results of his power, his everlasting power? We well, see it with this man. This man was tormented, and he now is transformed. And that's the story. When Jesus shows up on the shores of your heart, we go from tormented to transformed. And if I, I love that line where it says that the man sat there in his right mind. Have you ever wondered what it looks like to be in your right mind? It means you know Jesus. We are not in our right mind until we have known Jesus, until we experience Jesus. So there's the presence of evil everywhere. There's the power of the everlasting as he exorcises. And I want to finish with the paralysis the paralysis of the everyday man. This mob came from the town, and you remember what it said they did? They looked at the man, they looked at Jesus, and they said, Jesus, get out of here. They have that freedom. Have you ever thought about Jesus being a gentleman? In one moment, he's taking on thousands of demons. The next moment, these people, these everyday people, tell him to get out of town and he does not argue with them. He does not fight with them. He does not say, who do you think I am? I am that I am. He doesn't do that with them. He complies. They exercise their freedom to dismiss the Messiah. And we still have that freedom today. And many of us are exercising that freedom to dismiss the Messiah. You see, we have become really comfortable with evil, haven't we? I'm going to really step on some toes here. A lot of us are more concerned that statues are being toppled than that 3,000 children in the womb are being torn from limb to limb, their heads crushed every day. We've gotten used to that. We're comfortable with that. We're not comfortable with the statue falling down. You see what I'm saying? Have you become comfortable with evil? I want to really get to the gist of the story. When we look at the story, we see evil, right? Evil runs towards Jesus. And at the end of the story, we see this mob of people who say, Jesus, leave. Which is more evil? I would suggest to you that it is more evil to dismiss the Messiah than it is to struggle with demons. I know that sounds crazy. But what could be more evil than to tell the Messiah, see your way out. I don't want any part of you. And that's what these people said. Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 19, he weeps over Jerusalem. And he says, 
you have no idea what's about to happen to you. In 40 years, he's predicting they will be destroyed. And then he gives the reason for it. And the reason is this, because you did not recognize the Son of God. Why did Jerusalem get destroyed in AD 70? All of history points to that. It's not something I'm making up. Why? Jesus gave us the why. Because they dismissed the Son of God. They did not recognize him. They ushered him out. Now I want to ask you a very personal question. Have you dismissed the Son of God? Have you dismissed? Have you ushered out the Messiah? Maybe not in general. Maybe in general in your life you say, well, Lord, you're always welcome on my life. But there are places and there are times in my life where I am going to usher you out. Because I don't want your interference in the evil I'm involved in. There's a, a parable that comes out of the East. It's a really interesting parable I want to share with you. It's about a merchant who was traveling, very, very wealthy man, and it was obvious, uh, his, his wealth was obvious to anybody that saw him. And another traveler came alongside him and asked him, could I travel with you? Could I be your kind of companion as you travel, go in the same direction? And it wasn't uncommon in those days, I guess, maybe even today, for a man to go, yeah, let's travel together, that'll be safer. Well, it's not long before the merchant realizes this guy is a thief and this guy is after my money and he's carrying a lot of wealth with him. They would stop someplace at night and they would rent a place, they'd go in and here's what this merchant would always do. He would always tell the guy traveling with him, you can go in and wash up before bed, I'll, I'll do it second, you know, I'll do it after you. The guy would go in, he would take his wealth that he was carrying with him and he would place it under the pillow of this man, of this thief. Then the guy would come back out from washing up, the merchant would go in, the wealthy man would go in and he would wash up. And while he was washing up, that thief would go all throughout that guy's luggage, all throughout everything he was carrying with him, tear everything to pieces, looking for the wealth. This went on for several nights, but he never found it. After about three days, the merchant turned to this man who had been his companion now for some time and he said sir it's time that we part ways and I know that you're a thief and I know what it was you wanted from me and here's what's ironic he said the wealth was nearer to you than you ever thought it was always under your pillow what I love about that story is that the people of those villages in this story had no idea the wealth that was right in their midst and they never saw it. They never saw it. They had the Messiah right there under their pillow and they didn't know it. Do you know it? Do you know how close the wealth is to you? Jesus is the ultimate treasure and yet we look everywhere else searching to get treasures, to get worth, to get value and he's right here in our midst. Should you be more afraid of the demons, of the evil, or should, should you be more afraid, should I be more afraid that I am at any time dismissing the Messiah, saying you can show your way out, I've got other things to do. When I was in college, I uh, went uh, to Missouri for college, my first two and a half years of college, I had a couple friends there with me. and. We were going to go home for Christmas, so we wouldn't go home for Thanksgiving, so we had to find a place to go for Thanksgiving. And my two friends were brother and sister, and they said, we have relatives in Iowa. So we set it up so that we would drive up to Iowa. I had a yellow Grand Torino. It truly looked like a banana, but it drove like a lemon. We took the Grand Torino up to Iowa, and it's dark. And, uh, and we're driving along and they're not sure, they've actually never been to this aunt and uncle's house. And this is before all the modern technology, right, where you just type it in and it guides you right where you need to be. So they said, I think they live down this road. We turned down a dark country road, gravel road, drove for about two miles, past some farmhouses, and then they said, this must not be it. This doesn't look like, you know, where they live. We turned the old Grand Torino around and it died. It just died. We got out and we started walking. True story, we're walking along. The sun had set, 
maybe 45 minutes to an hour earlier. So there was still a bit of a glow on the horizon. As we're walking and talking and joking around and kind of getting a little worried about, are we going to find a farmhouse where we can call and get directions? All of a sudden we heard this rumbling. And we looked at each other and said, do you hear that? And one of the friends said, I feel that in the ground. We looked up on the horizon and we saw a cloud of dust and what must have been hundreds if not thousands of cattle running towards us. We looked at each other and said, we got to beat feet out of here. We started running. And literally in that moment, we thought we were going to be trampled by cows. We ran for maybe, I don't know, felt like 10 miles, but it was probably a quarter of a mile. And we looked back again, and the dust had settled, and the cows were gone. And we wondered, what, what happened? We walked closer to where we saw them coming from, and we looked down, and there was a gully that we did not see before, and at the bottom of the gully were all those cows. They had been stopped by a fence. There was a fence, a property fence, that we had never seen it was dark. I think of that, that night, and how we really thought we were in trouble, right? We thought evil was coming to get us. Now, a cow in my freezer is of God, but a cow running towards me is evil. And in that moment, we were, we were petrified. We had no idea that there was something that was protecting us that we could not see. Church there are so many of us who are living in fear. Living in fear of our health being taken, our lives being taken, of our culture being destroyed, this country going where it seems to be going. Can I remind you the greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world? Can I remind you that there is a protection built in where he will take care of us? Can I ask you this one last question? If the Son of God can show up on the shores of Galilee and show up on the shores of your heart and deal with the most hideous of creatures, what is it I'm afraid of? Why am I afraid? You need not be afraid. God is good. God is good. Evil is everywhere, but God is so much more powerful.